Thanks everyone for being so engaged in the morning discussion and hopefully we'll continue in that vein. Um, so uh, we are going to take questions from here and, and ask some quite general questions. But just before we do, because we do have people who are webcasting in, we've had two specific questions for two of the speakers. And I thought we would just ask them to start off with because the people patiently looking online, um, is, we're really happy to have them with us as well. So um, just before we sort of get started on the more general questions. So for Zubin, can the automated statistician help improve the transparency of neural networks by explaining their function clearly and simply to the general public? And if yes, how? Um, <coughs> that's a great question. Um, so I've actually tried to uh, convince some of my students to work on that. <laughs> and I haven't managed yet, but I might find a student to work on it because I think it would be very, very useful. Um, one of the questions to ask is what does transparency actually mean for um, a deep learning system? And you can talk about kind of aspects of the input-output behavior, or you can kind of try to understand what the um, internal functioning is doing. And there's a lot of great work um, Recently, in other groups, for example, Jeff Kloon's work um, uh, comes to mind where they're actually uh, visualizing the um, internal representations of neural networks. So that's one way of understanding or getting more transparency out of a neural network. But um, uh, I think most of the time, you don't really care about the internal architecture of something. You care about its input-output behavior. And so, uh, the way I would think about it is try to explain um, why a thing, a system makes mistakes when it does, um, and explain it in terms of the data, in terms of observable quantities. So, yeah, that's the thought. And the second question, oh, please. It's Vint. I, I just wanted to make a couple of observations. The first one is that um, for some of the uh, optimization functions, it's fairly simple. You know, like, don't lose the game if you're playing the game. Uh, for a self-driving car, it gets a little harder. You know, some of it might be don't run into anything. Uh, but there are probably some other elements that you have to deal with, like don't break any laws. And it starts to get a, a very complicated to explain even the uh, output function that you're trying to optimize. So uh, the, the demand for transparency is understandable. But figuring out how to get a system to explain itself, especially if it's heavily invested in uh, the sorts of neural networks that we've been discussing, is still very difficult to grasp. Maybe we should, um, there is a second question, but maybe we should push a little bit on the transparency issue because we have already had questions about it. Now, uh, what's interesting is we often see application where methods do well, and that's normal. You find the killer apps, which is going to get you the grant proposal, or, or, or which really, really work well. Uh, now, if we see things moving onwards from um, specific business applications where these non-transparent, inexplainable methods are working well, to say having an effect more in society, more in government, where every decision has to be justified or be justifiable, uh, what do you see as the main barriers and how can they be overcome? Anyone? So, oh, I'm just thinking about our sitting uh, <clears throat> president and trying to figure out if it's justifiable what he's doing. Okay, sorry, we won't go there. Um, I just wonder to what extent we'll, we'll be able to um, go down a path like that, especially if we have trouble explaining what's going, what's going on inside the algorithms. The best that I can think of to do is to document outcomes and maybe have statistical information showing what the outcomes have been in order to uh, say something about the validity or safety or other feature of the choices that are being made. And, and I, I think I want to I add that the, um, we have a lot of choice and flexibility in which machine learning algorithms and which approaches we use in what context. And there's a wide spectrum of uh, interpretability 
there are some systems that are actually quite explainable and quite uh, uh, interpretable, like um, relatively simple shallow decision trees. Um, there are things that are kind of an intermediate level of interpretability, like logistic regression systems or by naive Bayes systems. Um, and then there are the least interpretable systems. But even the least interpretable systems, there are, there are increasingly number of techniques to, to, to probe them. But I think that it's, we should marry the, the, the appropriate level of interpretability to the, the type of decision. Um, you know, for, uh, for spam classification, I just want it to cut out the spam, right? You know, and uh, it doesn't quite matter to me, well, you know, how did it know that this was? Um, so I, th I think it depends very much on the, on, the, on the application, and it's just part of the process, I think, of educating the larger community so that they can make the right decisions about what is the, what's the appropriate tool. Uh, so I want to add one thing uh, to this is that, uh, so humans, we are really bad at explaining why we have made a decision, <laughs> right? And we should consider this when we ask machines to really explain us all the details of what they did, what they did. Yeah, and I think, I think related to that, so one is the dimension of the application, and that dictates how much interpretability we need. But I think it's also a matter of interpretability for what purpose, right? That if it is that me as a researcher, I'm trying to make my model better, and so I would like to know what the failure cases are and what the model is doing wrong and what kinds of biases it has picked up on so that I can do something to fix it, then that's one kind of interpretability where I really want the explanation to be faithful to the model to correctly tell me what it actually is doing so that the solution that I come up with fits that. The other is sort of um, these situations where legally a system needs to provide an explanation as to why it did something. And there also you would probably want it to be faithful so that we know if it's picked up on biases that we don't want it to pick up on and so on. But then there's also, and maybe it's not so OK to talk about it, but I think it's important that there's also situations where sort of lay people, for whatever reasons, for whatever prejudices, might just be opposed to using a certain system just because it's automatic, perhaps like the massage chair situation, right? Where it may not be, <laughs> I mean, no offense there, but it might not be a very sort of rationally grounded fear of something and <laughs> and 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 if and if as if we as if we feel that the community has done the right thing in building the system that truly is reliable and we have full faith in that but the but the only block is sort of certain mental blocks in lay people then in that case producing an explanation that helps get over that whether or not it's actually faithful to what sort of that becomes besides the point and actually i remember an example that um, Rao had given at a meeting where apparently taxi drivers who are chatty are believed to be better drivers and the passenger will trust them more when in fact being chatty has nothing to do with whether they are actually a good driver or not. But if that's what it takes for me to convince someone that I'm a good driver, then maybe I should just be chatty, right? So I, I think there is that spectrum that's worth talking about and keeping in mind as we develop. And it's not a sort of a hypothetical thing. There are approaches where people are asking humans to explain why they answered a particular question a certain way, which goes back to what Raquel is saying. And humans are really bad at doing that. But if you force me to tell you why this is a picture of a person playing tennis, I'll come up with something that sounds plausible. And you can use that as ground truth to train an explanation mechanism that is as much of a black box as the original question answering system was in the first place. But it will spit out explanations that sound human-like because you trained it to produce human-like explanations. And is that OK or not? It's, not? it's not a clear answer. It might be OK in some situations if that makes somebody just go ahead and use it when we want them to be using it anyway. So yeah. Do we have the microphone? Because the gentleman wants yeah. to. That's just the classic point about bedside manners for doctors. So I mean, I think I completely agree with you that explanation is all about the other person's model, not about you. Most people who talk about interpretability in machine learning sometimes confuse soliloquy, talking to themselves with talking to others. And there are different people have different models. And I keep thinking about the fact that when a doctor comes up with a diagnosis about a rare disease for me, and I want them to explain it to me, what exactly are they saying other than making me feel kind of happy and good and leave? You know? And I think that does bring up a very interesting ethical, second order ethical questions. And, and I think you brought them, brought them out very well. In the sense, sometimes I think it's almost like that guy in, in Office and Gentleman that sometimes you can't deal with the truth because the truth is in a very different model and you don't even actually think in that model. And 
should systems be allowed to provide explanations that are only made to make their users feel better? And this is something that human doctors, human liars, human everything does. And that's how we keep our jobs. And, and yet, we don't want the machines to do it. <laughs> Any comments back from the panel to that one? And yeah, just a very quick one, which I, I mean, I, I agree. Sometimes interpretations are just to make people feel better. I think a good example of that is um, recommender systems in production recommender systems that people use will often give you an explanation like we recommend you this book because you bought this other book or something like that and clearly that's not what's going on it's not it's just one maybe most salient thing to convince the customer that there's some rhyme or reason uh, behind this um, so that's already in use and, and the other thing I think that's being brought up is the potential for deception which is um, uh, you know, a system that is very convincing at producing explanations can also deceive its users, and so they're sort of opening up a whole can of worms of uh, ethical issues there. Next. So, quick comment and a question. So, the comment was about I think Raquel's comment about comment about you know we we don't ex we, we we don't hold humans to the standard of you know please explain your decision in gory detail. Why should we or should we? Is it reasonable to expect to hold machines to such a standard? I think. So one possibly, you know, potentially optimistic response is this, you know, we've, we've come to terms with the fact that human decision making is cryptic and confused and irrational in many ways, and we've learned to build our systems around that process and do as best as we can. But maybe the optimistic view is that we hope that we could do better with machine-driven decision systems. And so then the question of interoperability doesn't become hold them to a higher standard, it's hold them to a standard that we hope to aspire to rather than one that you know, humans do. That's a comment, or maybe a long comment. The question I think for the panel I'm, I'm intrigued about is in this idea of interpretability, so you want to, let's say, generate an explanation for a decision that you made. Of course, most of these systems, the good ones, are adapting and learning over time. So if I was denied a loan last year by some automated system, and I was granted a loan this year by the same automated system, it's possible that in the process of that one year, it has learned lots more things, and its decision has changed. Now, we again, we accept that you know human decision making can evolve, but this idea of you know do we do we expect consistency? If we don't expect consistency, how is it going to play? I'd like to know what you all think about how you might incorporate that. Okay. Anyone feel like picking up the consistency question? So I think the the consistency question is a really good one, and again, I think it depends a lot on the the field of application that that you're interested in. This is something that I think is it's faced in real products all the time. That whenever you um, whenever you make an improvement to a machine learning system, I, I think it's it's very rarely the case that absolutely everything was either unchanged or improved. It's just that the vast majority of changes were improvements. Um, there are actually going to be a few cases where, oh, well, in this context, uh, this recommendation, this recommender system is suggesting a piece of music that is less in the same mood than the, the, the previous system did. I think that it's, it's, it's important whenever possible to make these things go smoothly and and have systems degrade gracefully rather than having discontinuous jumps or having gigantic outcomes. But when you're in the, the kind of application space that you gave as an example, where it's a binary decision space, uh, rather than say predicting some continuous value, um, it, it, small changes can have big outcomes for individual cases. And I think that that's something that when you build real products, you, you really have to attend to and, um, and deal with directly. But unfortunately, I don't think that there's a, a general answer because there, it isn't the case that we can just always um, promise to regress to our uh, previous decisions because that means halting progress and, and uh, arresting improvement. So sorry, I'm going to break in with, with a question from uh, the internet. Uh, so this is JT. Uh, it's on a very related question, but you go first. So I just wanted to bring also consistency. So it's also very related to fairness, right? 
And I think it's a point that we also uh, have to think about as the uh, system self-learn, whether our consistency is actually the worst thing that can happen, right? Which is we are getting more and more unfair, right? And now that we get, you know, premiums for health insurance and things like that in this country, right, to, to other, other aspects. And I think that's, uh, you know, it's very different in that context than, say, in the context of self-driving cars, uh, where we want to be consistent into good behavior, into something that we do well. So I'm going to move on to the related questions here. Uh, so uh, the question is, one issue about the black box context, such as with neural nets, is the ultimate challenge to certify systems with machine learning algorithms. Regulatory agencies focus on deterministic behavior and knowing that systems will produce a specific outcome, which is the consistency issue. To certify a system, such as an aircraft control system, engineers must explain the system's behavior how do we move forward to machine learning and need to know what an algorithm is doing? So this is Thomas Murray. I worry that uh, sometimes questions along this uh, line um, seem to demand perfection of the algorithms that are being used compared to human results. Uh, there are any number of airplane crashes, for example, that will be, uh, can be explained either by pilot error or by misunderstanding about how systems work or misreading of instruments or a bad design where information wasn't available, like the French aircraft that plunged into the uh, Atlantic, I guess, uh, had the three pitot tubes that were frozen, and so the data that was coming to the cockpit was misunderstood. The, the model they had of what the instruments were telling them was wrong. Um, so I'm a little concerned uh, with a, a persistent um, evidence that people who ask questions along these lines are expecting perfect results and will not accept anything less than that, even though uh, we don't expect humans to be perfect. So I don't know whether that's helpful, but I, I sense a certain amount of that in, in questions like this. So. Uh, I guess I, I, I'll let me make two comments. I mean, the first, relating to the previous question is, uh, very often the consumer of the explanation is going to be an engineer trying to debug the system. You better not lie to that engineer. So I think it's very important that you have a version of the explanation facility that is absolutely honest, and in fact, how do we, we have to debug the explanation facility too, and one of the criteria for what it means to be correct is that it is giving faithful explanations. Um, on the question of, uh, of, of certification, I think this is a terrific question and one that, uh, you know, I think in general the machine learning community has been focused on one thing which is accuracy, 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 performance, performance, performance. And we haven't really uh, any tradition of engineering in the sense of uh, maintainability, debugability, designability, explainability. And so I think in the next five to ten years we're, we're going to see a big um, uh, integration or perhaps collision between the software engineering world and the machine learning AI world as we bring these systems online. And I recommend super highly the terrific uh, papers that have been coming out of Google on the, uh, well, my favorite is, is the high interest credit card of technical debt paper. But uh, these companies are learning tremendous things about the realities of putting machine learning into these systems, including the debug and test and consistency and, and all these things. And uh, I just would love to get those educational materials because that's what we should be teaching in our classes in the universities is not just how to maximize the area under the ROC curve, but how to actually deploy and maintain a, um, a machine learning system successfully. Yeah, I, I, w I want to say that I, I actually believe that that is the, it's the lion's share of the work, uh, uh, and it's certainly the lion's share of the code. So when you look at real deployed systems for making products run, the fancy, shiny, super nifty machine learning bit is a very small footprint and uh, it took far less time than uh, all the details that go around it in order to, um, to provide the kind of reliability and dependability that, that uh, you know, even, even services like, like Google demand in order to, to run products. Um, and I think that that's part, I, I think that you're exactly right, that this is part of how this process matures, right? And it goes from the laboratory bench to, uh, to the to, uh, 
demo stands and proof of con concepts to real hard-nosed engineering that you depend on the same way that you depend on a suspension bridge. Uh, it's not that no suspension bridge has ever fallen down, but it's that we have good models about what the median time to failure is for a suspension bridge, and we should expect those same kinds of high standards. It's not perfection, right? It's just measured standards about, well, what, what is our expected error rate? Are we within our expected error rate? And if not, we're going to roll it back. Did you want to add? Well, I was, I, I was just thinking about the cases where there isn't a right answer, like a partial ordering, for instance. <laughs> There's a number of different partial orderings that might be perfectly legitimate. And so I'm, I'm thinking about especially uh, the search algorithm which in the end has to do something with 25 million hits. And it can't show all 25 million on the first page, so it has to do something. And you could argue a lot uh, which of the right ones to show up in what order, and people do argue about that. Small changes in the algorithm produce sometimes significant differences in uh, where these various results show up. And that has some real world consequences. Uh, so I'm, I'm just continually worried about uh, this uh, expectation that there are exact and right answers for everything, because I'm not convinced that there are. Just one small comment, but similar to the conversation with Raquel's talk on um, how changes in infrastructure might make some of the perception problems and other problems easier for autonomous driving, it might also be that similarly certain specific regula regulatory protocols might have to evolve to adapt to the way things are designed now, right? So it might be more of a back and forth than just the protocol staying fixed and then trying to get machine learning systems to prove that they meet those criteria, right? Those criteria are probably adapted for hand-engineered hand systems, so. so. There's actually, there's a very good uh, example of this infrastructure possibility. What if the cars could talk to each other? I mean, what if we had a common communication protocol? So no matter what the cars have been programmed to do, they also have local information that they can process. It says, you're about to run into somebody, you know, stop, uh, regardless of any other algorithm. And so having, or the cars come up to a four-way stop, and they have a little protocol that agrees who goes next instead of the usual macho, I'm going through no matter what anybody else says. These sorts of things can probably act as uh, multiple ways of, of coping, coping with um, uh, er, you know, potentially erratic behavior. Okay, next question. Um, so my, I have a question about the life cycle. I've personally never been part of any modeling project that wasn't obsolete before it ended. <clears throat> uh, the question is, uh, I'm really uh, interested in your uh, best practices or insight uh, lessons learned about how you keep a model that you have validated based on whatever retrospective data that you had. Uh, uh, still relevant prospectively in a production system. Yeah, so that's, um, I think that that's one of the things that's really, um, really uh, very rewarding about the kind of work that this is, is that um, it is very largely an opportunity for, for iterative innovation. Um, you never launch something that's perfect. Uh, you launch something that is good enough that you're excited about it, right? And you already have, uh, usually I think in the course of building these research projects, you end up with a list of ideas to try that's longer than you can possibly staff. And there becomes this kind of natural internal dialogue of trying to uh, prioritize and triage and come up with new ideas. Um, and I think it's very, very important in these kinds of settings that you have personnel rotating through projects. You don't try, it's just not all, it's not like there are th three, three people who just sit around, keep trying to make search better forever, right? You know, the people, you know, they move from one team to another, they, they, and they bring ideas from other problems that they've addressed. And then after they've kind of run some course of ideas and their interest has waned, they move on to, um, to other, other uh, problems. And I think that this is part of why um, environments like, like Facebook and Google, where there's really a host of problems that you can work on, is one where you can kind of keep the cycle of creativity going. Um, I, I feel pretty strongly that this uh, 
it is about the the creativity you've never at least in our current era it's it's never the case that you have you have not enumerated all of the ideas and you certainly have not tried the very best ideas uh, you've just got something that's working and you have to view the ceiling as being so high that you're not worried about running into it. Um, if you think that there's a ceiling, it's it's a false one. There's another floor. You just have to figure out how to get up there. Okay, next question. Um, I have, a, again, a comment and a question. And the comment is about transparency and the question is about something completely different. So, But the, going back to the transparency con conversation, I'm really glad that people are talking about systems AI. Uh, and I wanted to say quickly as a plug for my own group's work, we've been saying that learning belongs in modules for a very long time and that you can have hierarchically scuff scruffily constructed uh, priorities for a system. And we've shown recently that you can expose that hierarchy and even naive users get a much better idea of how the system is working and what its moral status is, that it's not an animal and things like that, if they just have exposure to the real code. And I really think we need to be honest about you know, when we have the sort of doctor level you know, conversations to make you feel happier and when we're exposing the true code. If anyone ever says they're exposing true code and then it turns out that that's a deception, we're toast, right? That, that's just a disaster. Okay, so anyway, that was my comment. Sorry about that. The question is back to something only, I think only uh, Vint Cerf talked about at the beginning and maybe that's great, but I wanna talk because this is the, the kind of place to talk about this. This is general AI, uh, the, or artificial general intelligence. I, I can't even talk about that in a way. The, the thing is that um, I think a lot of the beliefs about artificial general AI come from this mistaken idea that humans can learn anything. No animals can learn anything. And, and this, the combinatorial space of all the possible things we could know and do is, is immense. And why we're getting so good with AI right now is because um, we've learned to mine all the stuff that humans are good at. So that's why we're sort of approaching and slightly exceeding human uh, capacities. So that's my interpretation of artificial general intelligence. I think it's basically, uh, it's, a, it's a red herring. But I would love to hear the panel say that I'm wrong or that I'm right, but just I want to hear some clarity from this kind of experts in this kind of context about what we think of what artificial general intelligence really is or whether it even exists. Okay, that seems like an easy question. Who wants to pick it up? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to pile on and, and uh, start a fight with a large number of my colleagues, um, which is that I, I also actually feel that the, 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 the rallying cry or the torch of artificial general intelligence is something that is, is very inspiring and I think is something that a lot of people get excited about and are, uh, but I think are also tempted to make um, uh, premature predictions about. I'm not sure if I go as far as to say that it's a red herring, but I believe that what we're seeing in practice is the ability to, to extend the capabilities of machines, as, as Vince said at the beginning, in, in ways that are very deep, but are relatively narrow. And we can build useful things, things that are useful to people out of those systems. And indeed, we can even combine these or stack these and put them together in kind of um, an interesting uh, uh, bouquet of narrow things that, that allow us to get something that seems meteor. But still, largely, this is illusory, right? It's not, uh, it's not general intelligence. It's not general reasoning. I think some of these things will be, um, we will make progress on, but I think it's kind of moot whether it's generally intelligent. I think that what matters is that we're building systems that complement and augment our own abilities, right? Ultimately, we are the users of these systems, and we build things that are useful to us, and they allow us to accomplish things that weren't otherwise possible. Um, you know, whether that's you know using a steam shovel to to dig a ditch or using a, a a computer to calculate the trajectory that you need to get to the moon, right? You know, these are things that allow us to to comp they complement our abilities and allow us to reach higher heights. And I think that that's actually what is happening. And the AGI stuff is just like we all grew up right, re reading science fiction and like makes a really good sci-fi story, but I'm not sure about the rest. So um, I'm completely with Greg here. Um, we are in very serious trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, 
if we think about, I'm an engineer at heart, and so I don't like talking about things that I can't measure. And intelligence is one of those grab bag words that combines many, many different abilities. It's a very human-centric wor word. I would say if we try to be objective about this, then you know, objects, devices, animals, and humans live in a very high dimensional space, which we could measure by uh, thinking of tasks, metrics on those tasks of performance. And then at that, I mean, as soon as you do that, you realize that, or I realize that my iPhone is already more intelligent than me at several hundred tasks. Um, I may be more intelligent than it at a few other thousand tasks or something. Um, but you know, it's a very high dimensional space of things we could consider intelligent. And um, there isn't one general thing, there are underlying principles. It doesn't mean it's a whole bag of hacks, there are underlying principles. And if I said, if you asked me, if you pressed me for those principles, I would tell you what they are. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, you, the principles are how would you design mathematically a rational decision-making system that deals under uh, uncertain deals with uncertainty in complicated perceptual spaces. So you could come up with the principles that would get you that. Um, and you know, you can imagine that in some future we may have computers that can do all of the things that humans do better than the average human. Um, and maybe that's human level intelligence, but I wouldn't call that general intelligence. I think that's confusing. Uh, ben? Um, so I, I agree definitely with uh, Zubin as well. I'm also an engineer at heart, so, so I like to do things that sort of work and try to help us in what, what we do. Um, so I guess uh, maybe I answer you with a question, which is what does it mean to be intelligent? Is doing a task that a human does being intelligent? I'm not sure that's the actual definition, right? So, uh, you know, what we should focus on is in trying to make the best to get, you know, our lives better. And then we can worry about the general problem of, you know, is this intelligence or not? Um, I've been uh, gnawing at the edge of that question for a good part of the morning. Um, and it has to do a lot with representation of knowledge. Uh, we use these various machine learning systems because they have a particular representation which is manipulable in the way that you've been hearing. On the other hand, uh, general purpose intelligence usually uh, involves creating models of things that you can inference, uh, make inferences about. Uh, we've made many attempts to do that in the past in particular contexts, for example, mathematical logic where we use literally symbolic representations which are manipulable and we produce some interesting results that look like reasoning, in some cases better proofs than we have been able to achieve uh, with you know, you know, ordinary human uh, mathematicians. But that's not necessarily where we are today. I mean, for, for uh, the ability of a machine to build a model of the real world and reason about it is pretty limited. The one thing that I got very excited about as I listened to the machine learning um, space is that um, it's possible to create a, uh, an artificial world in which you present to the software that which it would have seen if it was using real sensors. So we can create artificial worlds that look exactly to the machine as it would have looked if they were using a real sensor. And the result of that is that we can run these things uh, through uh, experiences faster than we could in uh, real time. And in fact, we could do it in parallel with multiple processors. So there is this interesting possibility that we can make machines learn faster than humans could. Uh, for certain kinds of uh, applications. And the second thing that's interesting is that once you've done that, it's possible to replicate that understanding, that knowledge in multiple machines. Um, and that might be very important for manufacturing, for example, or other similar kinds of activity. So it feels like we are not there, but it feels like there's, there's, there's an edginess about this that uh, might open up to serious research at some point. 
And, and I just want to underscore the lack of diversity on this panel. Um, I don't. I don't know if this was. Uh, if this was. Uh, if there's some uh, a bias in the selection of people, or the, um, uh, or if it was just a, an unlucky draw. But it is very easy to find. I just want you all to know. It's very easy to find true believers uh, in AGI out there in the research community. Um, evidently, none of them are here today, but they do exist. Uh, um, and I enjoy arguing with them until I am red and then blue in the face, but. Okay, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to draw to a close right there, because I'm under strict instruction that we need to get going before 25 so we can start at 25. So thank you all for all the interesting conversation and discussions this morning, and let's thank all of our panel speakers. <laughs>